Hey everybody, it's the Trout and welcome to another episode of the Trout Show. Thank you so much for stopping by. It was decades ago that I got to hear that live album by the Allman Brothers that they did at the Fillmore. It's a double album and I'll never forget it. I still have a copy of it because it's one of the best recorded albums that I've ever heard. And it features this band, which was a southern rock band. Now, since then, I followed a lot of Southern rock bands, including, you know, Marshall Tucker, The Outlaws, Leonard Skinner, 38 Special. There's been a lot of them that have come to the forefront of about Southern rock music. But the, we've kind of lost a little bit of that because some of the people have passed on and some of the music has kind of faded. Great music will never fade completely, but Southern rock is something that I love to listen to. And I was fortunate to learn about a great Southern rock band called the Georgia Thunderbolts. And I got to speak with their lead singer, harmonica player, keyboard player, guitar player, T.J. Lyle. He sat and talked to me about the history of the band. They've got, these guys have known each other since school and how they've been together for several years and now are starting to make headway in the airwaves of America with their Southern rock styles. If you like Southern rock, and believe me, that's what these guys know, and they're out of Georgia, of course they have to be out of Georgia, right? I love their music. I loved really talking to TJ about the Georgia Thunderbolts, and I think they're going to make a lot of headway in that business. And it's glad to hear somebody new playing traditional style Southern rock. So if you like Southern rock and the way it grooves and pushes out, then you'll want to listen to this episode with TJ Lyle, lead singer harmonica player, keyboard player, with, that's right, the Georgia Thunderbolts. That's next on The Trout Show. Let's start out with the simple stuff. And I mean, I read, I read the background of everybody I visit with, obviously. I want to know more about them. Um, as soon as I heard you, you got to remember... I'm old enough to know when the Almond Brothers started and all wow. the Southern rock started. I saw the Almond Brothers. I won't even tell you the date was, but <laughs> I can tell you that Dwayne had already passed. Uh, wow. And I'm trying to think that I don't think, I think Barry may have still been there. Barry Oakley, the bass player may have still been there. So as soon as I hear, well, first off, I got the notification from your PR people about your new music coming out. And I went and listened to it. I went, oh, I kind of like this stuff. So then I delved dip, deeper into it. And it's like, and, and I know nobody. I'm a musician, as you can tell by all the guitars in the world. But nobody likes to pigeonhole. But there's nothing wrong with a brand new, you're not new, you've been around for a while, Southern rock type of style music coming out. I miss that. Yeah. So you guys, there's, how many's in the band? Four or five? How many have you? There's uh, five of us in the group. Okay. Did you guys meet in high school? Let's start with that. Logan and I, the rhythm guitar player, and I grew up together. We uh, started out in kindergarten. We met in kindergarten together. And Zach was the bass player, his neighbor for all of his life, still is today. And we pretty much grew up together, Logan and I. And then Zach came along. And then we actually met Bristol and Riley, who, were, who live in our Murchie in Rome. We met them about 2015 i think it was we were doing open mic thing up in the town and they used to have a really really good throwdown they used to have the the drums there the amps ready and guitars if you didn't have them you could just get up there and play which so i so thought they kind of had a black back line already ready and you just go do your thing okay go in there and play with anybody and we got in there and played together and you know it was like wow we we may can do this you know we're gonna have to practice but we may can do this <laughs> And so that was the formation of the, all the band around 2015. Yeah. Late 2015 into 16. Okay. So who was the one who said, oh, let's write our own songs? Who was the songwriter or how did, you, how did that all come about? I think that was, I, I was writing songs back when I first started playing music, back in 2013, uh, 13, 14, something around that time. And, we got together and we we never really thought much about covers. I mean, we had to do them. We had to learn yeah. them. Yeah, more everybody has to do that. Yeah, yeah. And it was more of like, well, let's write something. Let's let's just put some music to this and see how it comes out. And 
the very first song we ever wrote was our song looking for an old friend. Hmm. And you, as you, as a songwriter, we all know sometimes the easiest stuff is the more likely stuff that people like. Yeah. Oh yeah. Simple. You can spend your whole life working on one song for your, you know, everybody goes, and then you play it and be like, Bleh. then you get <laughs> yeah, a but... record song out and everybody goes, Oh my God, that's great. How long did it take you to write it? Count yeah. it now. Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. They're like, how did that happen? <laughs> did you, I assume, is everybody from Rome or from around that area? Around the area, Bristol and Riley are from Rome and Zach, Logan, and I, we're from Taylorsville, Georgia, which is about 35, 40 minutes southeast of Rome. Okay. So, and, and me and Logan and Zach live within two miles of each other. And that's cool. Bristol and Riley here live within two miles of each other. So it's, it's pretty tight knit. And, and the fact that you've been together so long already, um, you probably, the one thing everybody, nobody knows this unless you're in a band. Everybody has their own jokes and stuff in a band. Yeah. Everybody yeah. knows what's going on. And um, you're, you're around, you've been around long enough now to figure out everybody's idiosyncrasies. But then you've been around also long enough to get past the crap. Yeah. That breaks up bands. Yeah, yeah, we got over. You've been this long. It, you, you're probably unless somebody just goes crazy. You're probably going to stick together since you're starting to make some headway, and that's a good thing. Yeah, and we're we're all friends. We all get along, you know. And any kind of crap that gets in between us, no, nothing really gets in between us because we're so we're so tight. I mean, now everybody's so tight, we can just talk to each other. Communication is key. I mean, it really is. Yep. In everything. Oh yeah. <laughs> And, and, um, so when you start, when you started, so to speak, after you all got together, did you do the normal stuff? Like just trying to get gigs around where you lived or did you yeah. try to, how far is, how far are you from Atlanta? How far is that? It's a little ways. I know. Bill is probably 45 minutes from Atlanta. So not oh, too not far. No, no, not bad at all. Uh, we used to play around the Harley Davidson's around towards Atlanta. Oh, I uh, did that. I did that here in Dallas area. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We used to do those and then North Georgia. And then we go down to Atlanta and do them around the metro area of Atlanta. And then we go around and play any, any club that they would have us in. Let us open up for somebody or just let us play in a corner somewhere. I think that it, that's an interesting thing you just said because so many people want to get paid. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I don't want to play unless I get paid. Well, it's only going to be a hundred bucks. I don't care. It's a hundred bucks. Yeah. So when you said that to me, I know the direction you guys want to go. Yeah. Because to me, you have to play out to get better. There's no doubt about it, as long as you've got good players in it. We all want to go in the studio and record. We all love that kind of stuff. But you don't really tighten until you start playing out. But that is said, true. When you, got, when you said to me, you know, we just played around and wanted people to – you just wanted to play. You want people – A, you want to play because you love playing, and B, you want people to hear your music. Yeah, Absolutely. And now look at your situation. Yeah, we're definitely not in it for the money or uh, it would be over. Well, it'll come. I mean, it'll come. But then I was reading, you've had, you've opened up for some fairly substantial acts. We've been very fortunate to do that. You know, I have this conversation with everybody I talk to, especially people that are very talented. You're not fortunate, you're good. I mean, you're fortunate, <laughs> but you're good. Uh. Because you know the industry now is if you want to open for a lot of major acts, they want you to pay them yeah. to open. Not like the other days, you know, we're like, oh, yeah, great. We'll give you $1,000. We make 50000 you know, or whatever the number is. So, you know, and the fact that you've got already some of those like Blackberry Smoke and some people like that, they're already well known. Now, granted, they're on the same wavelength that you guys are. Yeah. But I, I – what – what is your kind of you, you've got this is it a new new album out or new song i know you're pushing something new we have a new single out but the album's coming in august okay and have you guys thought about how you want to promote that in other words you know there's all this conversation about do i release it all at one time do i do a song once in a while you know um mr trucks with that wonderful band with his name mm -hmm. in it 
uh, the last album they released last year, they did it one song at a time. Yeah. And I just talked to another great blues artist the other day, and she said, I'm coming out, but I'm only doing it one at a time. Um, yeah. But then you got to go out and support it. Yeah. So are, are you in, you got the album coming out. Are you guys then going to try to go on tour somewhat or get where you can start supporting the album? We're going to do, I guess it's become standard to do the single thing because we're going to be releasing singles. We have a few more until the album comes out. And then when we release it, we're going to tour heavy. We're going to push it, just physically push it by playing live as much as we can. Well, I liked what you said earlier. We didn't do a lot of covers, but we did had to do some, which means you guys are already used to using your own stuff. Yeah. And obviously, I would assume because you're starting to get more popular, people like it. Yeah, yeah, they really are. They're starting to enjoy it. And we're having shows now where people are actually singing the songs, and that's something mm -hmm. that I never would have thought of, you know, 10 years ago. It's, it's, inc it's an incredible feeling. No drug, nothing can make you feel that. It's incredible. Nobody understands that except the musician. Yeah. Um, interviewed somebody recently that they said they were in Europe. They were in the UK, but they went to Europe. And people in Europe are starting to sing their songs. And they're like, oh, my God, they can't even speak our language and they're singing our songs. It's an incredible that's, feeling, isn't it, when people are doing that? It's unreal. That's, that's what happened to us. We went on tour with Blackstone Cherry in Europe last year. Or, yeah, it was a year before last. And... We got over there. We were singing in like Austria, and they were saying, "Like, whoa!" <laughs> I think your music, though, has kind of a timeless feeling to it. Um, like I said, I grew up, and we just lost Dickie Betts, you know, recently. And then, of course, you got that that music still going on. It's it's timeless because there's something about you guys, and you guys have that too. You're you're writing and you're playing, and I'm I'm a big I don't play, I can try, but I really like somebody plays a harmonica like you do. Oh, I appreciate it. I mean, that really adds a lot to the, the song. And then you got your slide guy and all that stuff. But yeah. And, and like I said in earlier, you don't want to get put into a box, but there's nothing wrong with being in a box that says, what are they like? Well, obviously yeah. when you open up for the people you open up, you know what you're getting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you're not going to be doing <laughs> I'm going to stop and go, we'd like to do a ballad now. That's yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, tell me a little bit about your personal lives. Are any of you married? Have kids um, or anything like that? No, no, we're not married. Uh, we uh, we play and we've, we've honestly just spent so much time doing this. We really don't know anything else. So <laughs> it's now we're kind of catching back up on things we have a little downtime right now before the album comes out we're kind of catching back on we're out here working and stuff and it's just like it's not a relief it's just something new for a minute yeah keep your mind off the road because the road will wear you out quick and it's yeah. a good pressure well and you know when you're on the road a lot when you don't even know what town you're in oh yeah i don't even know anymore <laughs> and and you're like where are we tonight yeah. And that's why I used to laugh at the old bands when they get up and say, you know, we always joked about, good night, Detroit. We're not in Detroit. We're in <laughs> St. Louis. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that happens more often than not. I, every time before we play, I ask, what state are we in? <laughs> What's the city? <laughs> Just remember it. Well, you know, the other thing that's hard about touring, too, is – there's no continuity to it. Yeah, you get up and play the same songs every night, but every night you play, the sound is different. Oh, yeah. And that, that's hard. I mean, you have to get over it, but it's like, oh, okay, this is the night. Tomorrow night will be somewhere else or two days from now. We just make sure, we're trying to make sure the best we can that it sounds good out front, no matter what it sounds like on the stage. We just play. So tell me a little bit about your songwriting stuff. Do you guys get together or you guys have some ideas or you come in with the idea and say, hey, about this? Because I mean, tell me a little bit about how you do that. A little bit of both. Uh, when we practice and we rehearse and we get in a room together, we write. That's what we normally do. We don't jam. I mean, we, we normally just get in there and see what anybody has. And if we don't have anything, then we'll start to play around. Then we'll start to find, you know, uh, a melody that can go with the guitar and all this stuff. But sometimes even I'll write the song at home 
and bring it into the guys. Just like on this uh, last trip to the studio, I did that with a song. We were needing one more song, and I was just racking my brain. I was just trying to figure it out, trying to think about it. I'd been listening to a uh, a ton of Beatles, and I've been listening to a lot of Beatles and a lot of Ray Charles around that time, a lot of soul music. And I started playing these really neat chords on the guitar, and I just started singing over it, and um, I hit the record button on my phone, went into the studio, and that's all we had of it. Mm -hmm. Sat there and worked the song up in the studio, and it turned out to be one of my favorite on the new record. What's the name of the tune? It's called Crawling. It's a funny thing about that stuff. About you never know when you can write. I've never been one to before. I don't come in here. I'm just my studio, my stuff here. But I don't go in the idea that oh, I'm going to write a song. I may, I may come up with that idea. But the thing is, it doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. When you're driving down your street and you go, hey, that'd be a good name for a song. That, that's when it works, right there. <laughs> and don't you think to you, you don't want to steal, but you want to get some new ideas. I mean, you're as far away from Beatles music and Ray Charles. It doesn't really make sense, yeah. but it does. Don't you think it kind of gives you some new ideas? It does. It, it brings in a whole new life to the style of music that we play, and it brings on new melodies and new inspirations and new just uh, 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 the more knowledgeable you are about what you listen to, I feel, and it's really shown in my writing a lot, especially on this new record. I've been listening to everything, and I've always listened to it, but I've been listening to everything from Glenn Miller to Tommy Dorsey to Sinatra. <laughs> the, the, the modern time soundtrack, Charlie Chaplin, all that stuff is coming into play on this stuff, and I'm hearing it in my head, and I'm hearing a certain way that I would used to play, and it's going somewhere else completely I never would have thought of before. I think that's a brilliant idea. I don't, I don't have... I mean, obviously, there's certain music I like better than others, but at the end of the day, I listen to everything. Yeah, and you really have to. I mean, you don't have to, but it's really good to. Yeah, I mean, because you can't discount people like you just mentioned, Glenn Miller and, just, and uh, Dorsey, that have been around for decades upon decades, and people still playing their music. Yeah. And it's not because they suck. It's just that they love that music. Uh, we've played some of the new stuff live and people say it sounds like Bob Seger or some, somebody the other day said it sounded like Crosby, Stills and Nash. I was like, what? <laughs> if you take that from that, more power to you. <laughs> I don't care as long as they like it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We haven't had had many beer cans thrown at us at the last. <laughs> <in> the <la> <laughs> <laughs> How's, how are you doing in your towns and all that stuff people know who you are they're familiar with the band enough yeah yeah actually the past year or so it's actually picked up a lot uh, last year we sold out our hometown theater cool uh, yeah that was really neat that was a big shock for all of us and we were really happy you know that people actually came out and listened it was a little loud some people left but <laughs> uh but we uh your I name has got thunderbolts in it it's not I going to be soft <laughs> No, and it's going to be loud. That's what a lot of people think, too. We'll come out we'll come out, and they'll look at us and be like, oh, it's going to be a, a country act. Now, we actually got booked for a show one time in Leesburg, Alabama, as a Southern gospel group. <laughs> <laughs> that is no joke. How would they get that? Out of the ch I guess names don't mean anything. Well, they don't. I I guess not. I mean, I you spent how many times have I been in bands that we spent all our life trying to figure out what we're going to name it, and then you realize at the end of the day nobody cares. It's the song. It's the it's the music, and if they're listening to you, they'll remember your name. Yeah, I don't think anybody remembers the the Fruit Gum Company. You remember that one? Nineteen Ten Fruit Gum Company. What a name! Uh, uh, the, uh, let me hold on. Da, 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 da. It's a three chord song. Da, da, da. Yeah, I, I can hear it, but I'm trying to remember. It was a stupid song. I thought it was stupid back then. I was young. Incense and peppermint. Incense and peppermint. Oh, that was a great tune. I had to 45 on that. I got uh, that on box at the house. I got one of those old jukeboxes at the house. Incense and peppermint. Definitely. And you, and you can find all those videos on YouTube and see all those Paisley, Paisley crap that they were in back then. Of course, we all thought that was, oh my God, it's really cool. Yeah. Those big. Uh, 
uh, cameras where they'd come out and do the psychedelic colors and the, <laughs> it's like a kaleidoscope just coming out, make you car sick. We played on the Rock Legends cruise last year and it was a fantastic show. Oh, that's we, cool. We got to play with Deep Purple and Roger Daltrey from The Who. Uh, and it, it was like, it was um, nowhere near old enough to have seen the Beatles live or anything uh, like that. I, I feel like that is as close as I got to see that era. When well, Rod, when you Rod, got, who was originally, who was still with the band in Deep Purple? They had one or two original members, didn't they? It's uh, Ian Gillen's there. He's still uh, there. Ian Pace is there. Okay. Steve Morse was there, but he had to come off the road for his wife. He Roger Glover did, and of course, John Lord passed away, I think. The keyboard player, he passed away. And they Richie, have, Black, Richie Blackmore, that was the guy that played the, the guitar. Yeah, they have uh, Don Airy, Donald Airy, who played with, I think he played with Ozzy. He played a bunch, a bunch of big bands and stuff like that. He's fantastic, but he's uh, <clears throat> he took a lot of John Lord, and that's some mighty heavy shoes to fill. Well, if you meet the royalty of Mr. Roger Daltrey, come on. Oh, my God, that guy. When he got on stage, he just turned eighty, I think. He just turned. It's like, he got he got on stage and he started playing, and it was like looking at him was like looking into a looking at like some god on stage or something. You just <laughs> oh, this guy, and he was doing the microphone throw and the spin and everything. I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is had to be. I, I got a glimpse of what it could have been like. It was um, different than it is now. You know, yeah. there wasn't there wasn't all the fancy background stuff that you can put in and all that stuff they have now, which is cool. <laughs> Expensive, but it's cool. Um, it was basically come out and play. Uh, that's I what the, I... I saw The Who and Arrowhead in 1989. Wow. Uh, John Enthwistle was still with them. Uh, before he passed away, and they had um, Simon Phillips was the drummer, played with Toto. Wow. There's just something about that when, you know, it's kind of like, you know this because you've opened up for people, but when you go see a concert, the opening band can be really good, but then when the big band shows up, there's something, as soon as they start playing the first note, you're going like, why is it different? Yeah, everything changes. And so how did you get involved with the the cruise? I mean, that's pretty cool. Are you guys going to get back invited again? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know yet. Um, we got invited to be on there. Uh, I don't now, know. Is that, actually, the one, is that the one in, is it leave out of Miami or is that the one, where does it leave out of Miami? Miami. Yeah. yeah. It, it leaves out of Miami. We, we were on there. It was, uh, we're good friends with Doug Gray from the Marshall Tucker band Ah. and Henry Paul from the outlaws and there Richard, you know, there's Young. two other great bands out of the South right there. Yeah. Yeah. And Richard Young, who is our manager, he's with the Kentucky headhunters and they had played on that cruise before. I was going to ask you if he was still with you. Cause I didn't know it said something about he was, he was your manager. Yeah, he still is. Sure is. Well, you got somebody there that knows the business. Yeah, he knows it. I mean, he knows it better than anybody. He's been doing it for 50 years. I mean, even before the headhunters hit, he had a band, Itchy Brother, and they were signed to Swan Song. Oh, man. That was uh, Zeppelin's label. Yep. Yeah. I remember that one. I forgot who was the major. I, don't, I forgot who distributed but it, but I remember that label. Their manager, the headhunters manager, is actu actually Mitchell Fox, who was Led Zeppelin's manager from 76 to end. Wow. What I tell people about the music industry is everybody knows everybody. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, eventually really. you cross, you know, you cross paths with people. So, do you play? What else do you play? Do you play guitar? I mean, how do you? I mean, what else do you play? I play uh, guitar. I play piano, harmonica. I play a little bit of pedal steel. I'm not the best at it because it's the oh, hardest man. thing. That's yeah, it's the hard. Uh, it's the hardest instrument I've ever tried to tackle. I don't even. I don't even understand it. <laughs> no, I just try to hear it and then try to do it. Just close my eyes and then get here, <laughs> walk away. Uh, but mainly just guitar, harmonica, and piano. And then, so you got a bass player? Do you have another two guitar players or a keyboard player? Two guitar players, yeah. Okay. 
And do they, do you have one main lead or do they share leads? Uh, Riley, no, they share, but Riley does majority of the lead. Is he the slide player too, or is he, are they both place the lead? Yeah, he's the slide player too. You know what I think I like about you, TJ, is the fact that you're very w well rounded in the music. Yeah. I, think, I have no doubt that you guys know where you want to go. Yeah. But you also are sucking up the atmosphere as you go along. I'm a sponge, man. I take it all in. Are you finished recording the album? Are you done with it? Yeah, it's okay. done. It's ready to be released. Just got to pump out a few more singles, I think. When you guys work on an album, do you, I'm always curious about with musicians, how much, you obviously have your engineer, and who produced it? Do you have one producer that did, helped you with it? Richard. That's why I figured it'd be him. Do you guys sit and listen to it and help them mix? Um, do you have input or you just say, you know what we like, or, I mean, everybody has a different feeling about it. There's a lot more input on this record. Um, but we don't sit in there with them, actually. They just send it to us. We play it through our cars or through our speakers, whatever we listen to, and we just give them our feedback like that. They just okay. send it through. Yeah, because some people don't want to know. They don't want to know, you know, all the nuances and this and that and compression and all that stuff and all that stuff. Hands but on. You also, but everybody, and everybody, as I've said this many times since I'm a producer, too, is that everybody's feeling about mastering or mixing is different. Yeah, oh yeah. So you have your feeling, and I said this with somebody the other day. I said, if you had 10 people in here mixing, they'd all be doing it different. Yeah, it doesn't matter. If they know the same stuff, it would all come out different because of the ear. Yeah, and you don't know. It's like, well, I didn't want to put reverb on that, or I would have put a higher, you know, whatever. So, but I, I think the thing about it, that's that's what the music industry is, is, is a it's creative arts, because you never know. And yeah. you were talking about the Beatles, Listen to the original Beatles stuff that was recorded on like four tracks, or it, there was two four tracks and they put them together, and they had all the drums coming out over one side and, and all the guitars over on one side, and they thought that was cool stereo. Tried to, they tried to work that mono split, <laughs> and and it's like, and of course we didn't know. I mean, I, when I was a kid, I used to buy the albums in mono, and it, when it started stereo, oh my god, I can tell you, oh my god, I'm gonna tell you this, I was just a kid. My first stereo album was Beatles 65 because it was in stereo. Wow. Beatles 65, stereo. My parents got me like they, were, they didn't understand. And Hendrix album came out. The year Electric Ladyland came out in 1968. All my friends were buying Tommy. I'm talking about Roger Daltrey. Came yeah. out at the same time. And I went, are you going to listen to Tommy? Go, are you kidding me? I got Jimi Hendrix. So my parents had a big record console. Of course, everything was on records and vinyl. And I told him, I said, buy me this thing so I could hook up my headphones. And so you, it had wires. It didn't even have a jack. And you hooked them up yeah. to the speakers. And I think they had a magnified made of my headphones. And I listened to that record and I went, mm -hmm. and I'm going, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and I thought, how did they do that? And of course, then I learned later how they, <laughs> they did it. Yeah. But that's the thing, and I, I think part of it is, too, in today's world of music, it's gotten so overproduced. Oh, yeah, big time. When I, that's why I like bands like you. You're just a rock band that wants to play rock music that people yeah. like with a melody line. Excuse me, melody line. There's not a lot of nuance there. No. And, we're, and, we're Play, we're going to play whether we have a cold or not. We're not going to try to save it. Well, they get into, I was, I was watching somebody on YouTube, they get in with a team of writers now for all these famous stars. And it's like, that's, you know, and, and some people are like, well, they decided to put this chord in here because of that. And I go, I never write that way. I just write a song. I think they, I don't know. I, I think they do that on those big songs because it's like a, it's almost at that point, it's like a money grab. If well, the yeah, song, they're trying to make more money on it. Yeah. And we don't write like, I don't write like that. And we, we're just bare bones. I mean, we get up there, we turn it up as loud as it'll go if the venue lets us. We, <laughs> we bring out the monitors, set them up, the wheel, we'll get that fixed. And then we're going to, I mean, we're going to give it everything we got. You know, we have nothing to fall back on but ourselves. And I bet you, do any of you wear ear monitors? 
Uh, I tried it for a while, then they kind of hurt my ears, and I took them out. I've had. I don't like them. Yeah, I don't like them myself. I want to hear the music. Yeah, I want to feel it. I mean, it takes so much away from it. It becomes like a once you put those in, you can't hear anything else. It becomes really stale. And I don't. Well, I don't. It's not the same. And you know, I, Alex Lifeson with the uh, Rush didn't listen to him. I mean. Uh, Getty wore him for a long time, and he kept. I guess the story is he kept telling Alex he needed to wear him. He goes, "No, I'm not going to." He finally started to, but he still had all the monitors in front of him. Yeah, and I, I, I know Mick Jagger doesn't. Keith Richards, <laughs> they don't have them. No, uh, uh-uh. uh. You know, because they don't need them. Roger Daltrey and, didn't either. No, they're from that school. Yeah, that's one of the reasons Beat Townsend can't hear is because he played a them <laughs> so much. So tell me real quick before I hang. I don't want to keep you because I know it's an hour later over there. Um, what is your lead guitar player? Does he play? What kind of amp does he play out of normally? He plays a Bogner Shiva a lot. Bogner. Yeah, he does. And uh, he recently got a – what is that amp he got recently? He tried a Marshall out for a while, and it kept giving him trouble. Um, and it just – he went down. He went back to the Bogner, he's, he's, and it sounds really good. It sounds really good. He, he's got this new telly that he plays on it, and it's got a, a nice, you know, aggressive mid to it. But when he plugs up the Les Paul, it's still got that bite and sustain, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah, Bogner. You don't see a lot of people. I have a. Mar- it's sitting right behind me. You just can't see it. The Marshall is. Um, and do you do you have amps, or do you even play guitar often when you get play? I just play acoustic for right now. Just what's, play your, what's your guitar? What do you play at your acoustic? Just out of curiosity. D28 Martin. Yeah. yeah. Can't go wrong with the Martin or a Taylor. No. Yeah. I love yeah. them both. I, I love the way the body of a Martin sounds, especially a Dreadnought. I mean, it's just oh yeah, amazing. So you're off in a little bit hiatus right now. Yeah. And when, I'm sorry, tell me again. I know you told me. When is the first song... Is it out now or getting ready? To, I guess there's two things, the song and then the album. But when you tell me again about the dates on that. The single Stand Up is out now, and you can stream okay. it. But okay. the al- album is coming out Friday, August 23rd. And what's the name? It's Rise Above It All. How many How many tunes? I'm just curious. How many tunes are on there? 13. Oh, wow. It's a big number. Yeah. yeah. And how long did you work on it? From the time <sighs> you started writing until you finished uh, probably about eight months. That's not too long. Yeah, about eight months. Is it it was in, about it? in between touring and stuff too. Because oh, I had yeah. written. So, do you write very much on the road, by the way? I uh, I had written some of the songs for the new album. A few of them I had written the start of the idea, just the lyrics and the melody. I had written those while we were on tour in Europe. So, just had Isn't that. It- isn't it funny? You're playing all the time. You're still writing music. <laughs> I can't stop. Why I constantly phone in case I get a melody. I'm like, doo, 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 doo. <laughs> <laughs> well, TJ, you have a wonderful evening. Oh, you too. Thank you and so much. You have a, um, wish you all the luck on the album. Thank and, you so much. Uh, Well, that's it for this episode of the Trout Show. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it very much. Very big special thanks and shout out to T.J. Lyle from the Georgia Thunderbolts for sitting down and talking to me about the band and all their great music and where they're going from here. If you want to know more about them and if you like Southern Rock, I'd suggest you go to their website, georgiathunderbolts.com, georgiathunderbolts.com. And you can find everything there. The videos, talks about when they're releasing their music and all that great stuff, georgiathunderbolts.com. So, people, if you want to know more about The Trout Show, all you got to do is go to our website, thetroutshow.com, and it will tell you everything you need to know about videos on YouTube, everything that's coming out on podcasts, music that's coming out from The Trout, and all sorts of great things there. That's thetroutshow.com. So until next time, people, you know what I always say. It's only rock and roll, but I love it. See ya. See ya.